everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so before we our, begin the lecture tonight, I would like to acknowledge today that we honor the indigenous people whose traditional ancestral homelands we stand on, the Multnomah, the Klamath, uh, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watla bands of the Chinook, and the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous natures, uh, nations of the Columbia ri River. It's important to acknowledge the ancestors of the place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor, honor their legacy, lives, uh, descendants, the past, um, past, present, and future. So good evening. Welcome to PNCA and the Halley Ford School of Graduate Studies Lecture Series. I'm Sarah Houston, the program head of the MFA in Applied Craft and Design, and we're happy to have you here tonight. Um, tonight's lecture is sponsored by the uh, Applied Craft and Design program and is part of the Halley Ford School of Graduate Studies lecture series that happens on Wednesdays at 6.30 here at PNCA. So join us next Wednesday, February 26th for um, CC Moss. So I'm really excited um, to welcome Anya Jaworska for this evening's lecture on her creative practice and work. So a little bit about Anya. Anya is an architect, designer, and educator. Her practice focuses on exploring the connection between architecture and art. And her work explores bold, simple forms, humor, commentary, and conceptual, historical, and cultural references. She is currently a clinical assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Architecture. She holds a master's degree in architecture from Krakow University of Technology in Poland, as well as the Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan. Her work has been presented at the Venice Biennale, Ch Chicago Architectural Biennale, Lisbon Architectural Triennale, MoMA, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Cranbrook Art Museum, the Graham Foundation, Harvard University's GSD, the Storefront for Architecture and Art, Chamber Gallery, Friedman Benda Gallery, um, and Taiwan Craft Research and Development Institute, among others. She is a 2017 MoMA PS1 Young Architects Program finalist and her work is currently represented by Volume Gallery in Chicago. Please help me in giving a very warm welcome to Anya Jararski. Thank you for the introduction. That was like a very extended list. <laughs> thank you for having me. <clears throat> um, and thank you for, uh, I talked to some students today already and it was such wonderful conversation and experience and really excited to be here. And also to, to see sun and warmer temperatures. Um, <laughs> Chicago is frozen right now. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I think I will just dive in right into this VIP presentation that you are a part of. Um, and as part of this presentation, I would like to show uh, projects that through drawings, installation, sculpture, proposals, and furniture, um, explore and investigate architecture, uh, its history, form, uh, function, and concepts. Architecture to me is research, inquiry, and development of work. And then so very often, as you will see, uh, my work is um, functions as its own kind of final um, product, but also a proposal because I work between scales. Um, I think this is something that um, I like to explore, that it's never necessarily finished, although it's finished. Um, I also, maybe it's a little bit of a cliche to say this, but I like to think that my work is um, simultaneously simple and complex, uh, familiar and unfamiliar, and funny and serious. And then so <coughs> I wanted to start with the first project. It was my first commission after moving to Chicago. 
uh, it was a commission for the Graham Foundation, uh, which uh, serves as a um, uh, Graham Foundation, which supports uh, art and architecture projects, and also uh, they open a bookshop for um, kind of uh, publications that are not available anywhere else. Um, so it was a cl project for a great cli client. Um, it is a very practical project. Um, it had a very tight deadline. I like to mention this because it was designed and produced within two months and installed within two months. And it was initially thought of, thought of as a pop-up um, uh, shop, but it's been there for six years and it seems like it's going to stay. Um, I don't know if you can hear me if I'm far away from the, um, is it the microphone situation fine? A little bit more, yeah, okay. <laughs> I just noticed that there's no, um, yeah. And I also when I turn a look at the screen, I think that's another thing. All right. So I'm very proud of this project. And um, oh, let's go this way. And then, so the bookshop was launched in conjunction with the opening of environments and counter environments. Uh, Italy, the new domestic landscape. Uh, it was a kind of exhibition that was brought from MoMA that was uh, happened in uh, 1972. And um, the parts of the exhibition that were brought into Graham Foundation were featuring works um, and documents of the iconic Italian designers, specifically focusing on an environments um, from that period. So the exhibition provided an opportunity for me to think about a uh, bookstore as an environment uh, where iconic forms, unexpected material, and color could be utilized. So kind of referencing to to some of the examples that are also showcased in the in the show. So the bookstore is compo composed of four tables um, that divide the space of the room. Uh, the vertical forms extend from each table, uh, such as gateway arch, staircase, um, towers, that function as symbols, but also bookshelves and partitions, uh, providing intimate um, spaces and directing the interactions of people who explore the shop and books. <coughs> And so I used this uh, very inexpensive material, expanded uh, metal mesh uh, that is um, throughout the entire installation, which contrasts the bold forms and provides translucence and lightness, lightness which also allows, to, allows the room to become still integral part of the entire installation. So it's still... Um, it's still, you can see um, the, you know, paneling um, of, the, of the room, which, uh, which was very important to me. So this is, um, this is expensive, inexpensive material. This is the expanded metal mesh in its kind of raw form. Uh, you might know this, you know, you know this material, it's everywhere in the city environment, uh, utilized as fencing, as gates, um, sometimes as outdoor furniture. And I was very interested in drama dramatically changing the kind of reading of this material through the application of this high gloss but very gentle pale green color um, and making it appear much lighter and softer and allowing for the furniture to become um, a backdrop uh, for the books. So you can see that the sheer effect of the material um, allows for books to populate the the shelves and the horizontal surfaces, and in turn, they also activate the installation. So I was very interested in creating a pattern, but also a pattern through the um, through the books themselves. So the composition, every time the books change, the composition changes, and then the reading of the shop slightly changes as well. And uh, I was very interested in that in context also to Italian design, of course, Memphis, uh, you know, it kind of references the very vivid patterns uh, by Nathalie de Pasquier. And, um, and also thinking about how the, you know, how, to, how the books kind of interact with the shelving units. So some, uh, some, are, some are kind of zigzagged, uh, some are raised, uh, allowing for the kind of different range of compositional strategies uh, for the books themselves. Um, I was very also conscious about the height of a table uh, or a height of, um, 
not only a shelving unit, but how you um, kind of enter a bookshop and I identify the problem that the tables were always too low. Uh, and especially that you come in with your jacket or you know purse and you want to look at the book, but it's too low and it's quite uncomfortable. So I wanted to make the experience very comfortable so the 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 tables are are a little higher so then you can just flip through the book and so I was very interested in the fact that you had a lot of surface to be very comfortable in the environment um, so in general the kind of forms and the color and the sheerness of the installation they generate a variety of uh, visual layers um, which are also changed by the um, kind of light and viewing angle. It's uh, something that I didn't predict, um, but it was also very important um, for the um, for the client um, was that they were not they were visible from the outside. Uh, therefore, there were vertical uh, elements, uh, but also the the two walls are actually windows, and two walls are paneling. So it's, it's interesting how the reading of the material uh, changes and the color changes depending on which, um, what time of the day you come in. Uh, so the, the diamond pattern also kind of alludes to the ornamental ceiling um, of, the, of, the, of the house, of the building. And I think the color complements the warm tones of the paneling. And the tower incorporates neon sign high which demands attention even from the street level. Uh, this is a mansion uh, in a, uh, one district of Chicago, very residential district of Chicago. So this was also kind of a consideration to make sure that, the, um, that there's a sign um, that allows for the people who are in the neighborhood to kind of dis have a distinction between this being a public space versus domestic space. Uh, the most recent installation uh, that I produced uh, is this entrance installation um, that occupied a Randolph Street lobby of the Chicago Cultural Center during the 2017 Chicago Architecture Biennial. Um, and then throughout, um, it was an interesting assignment um, because it was the first thing you would see upon entering the building, but also the first one you would um, pass in order to get to the exhibition, the actual exhibition, which was, which is a, uh, I don't know, four story building filled with uh, amazing work, uh, quite, quite a big scale exhibition. Um, so I was very interested in, um, in uh, making a statement um, upon entering, but also making a statement about what is possibly uh, going to be showcased within the exhibition, within the Biennale. Uh, and then the, um, and the Biennial's um, title was Make New History. So I thought that throughout this kind of bold forms and color and formal references and the use of space, um, I wanted it to command attention provide this entry point um, and reflect of the title, Make New History. So the entrance installation um, kind of entertains multiple readings and maybe contradictory readings. Uh, in many ways, it is furniture and it's not. It is a sculpture, it's a pavilion, but also it's not any of those things. Um, and the installation uses two very familiar iconic forms uh, in architectural language, uh, the arch and column, um, to lightly call on architectural history and establish meaning while simultaneously undermining it. Um, so because of their use, the use of those elements and overuse actually, and reinvention throughout the history, I think those two elements uh, function both, I mean, in, within history, they function both as structure, but also as a symbol. Uh, and I think we were quite familiar with those, um, with those elements. So in this case, the arch highlights the entrance and also contradicts it. It's built, um, it's quite, quite big actually. Uh, it creates physical boundaries. So upon entering, you actually like faced with this arch, the wall. Uh, and um, I think similar, the uh, the kind of elevated column, uh, kind of it's 
its uh, purpose is to invoke kind of stability uh, and tradition, but in this case, the column is kind of not supported by anything and doesn't support anything as well, uh, and has this very kind of thin cantilevered uh, countertop that is um, almost also impassable. Um, so another aspect of this work is that this room uh, is a perfect nine square grid. Um, <coughs> And it's symmetrical with rich materials, ornamentation. And um, the one thing this installation is doing is hiding another um, desk, uh, information desk, which was just put in the space uh, a few months earlier. And the building did not want to remove it, but it was put off center <laughs> to this perfect nine square grid, which created a problem for me and maybe a problem that I wanted to solve so I wanted to distribute the objects within the, within the space in a very kind of asymmetrical um, manner uh, in order to kind of play with the perfection of the nice square grid, uh, but also this kind of offset idea. Uh, so you, will, um, you can see the kind of corner arch, the kind of weirdly placed columns again. Um, and then I also thought that it was interesting to maybe pair this very unusually thin profile um, and this neon yellow color that kind of exaggerated the kind of flatness and contradiction um, of the of, of the um, contradiction to the space but also allowing the installation to produce a cohesive environment within that space so I really wanted to create um, kind of like a capsule almost like a space within a space that has a relationship to the to the existing um, room uh, but also contradicts it. So um, it, of course, commanded attention and divided space uh, in a very tricky way, uh, I might say. And, um, and the neon yellow color is actually the true neon yellow that you see in the signage on the street. It's super intense. Um, that was the only color that actually um, could stand against the kind of ornamental, a, a bit dim, maybe you can't see that, but like at the next room you can see it's quite dim uh, lighting. Uh, we didn't have a chance to play with the lighting. Um, so, um, so it also becomes very much so a signage uh, because it is really a color of a sign. Um, and I think even farther kind of flattens the forms and um, even farther kind of makes them um, almost paper-like. Uh, it was few tons of steel, just on a side note. <laughs> um, so you can see in here the idea of the column um, uh, and arch as a symbol is also explored in this installation. Uh, this black room is filled with black sculptures uh, and it was called Cynic Architectures. Um, and it was part of my solo exhibition in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Uh, this piece in front is called Gated Area and is composed of the semicircular uh, arch entrance and the horizontal circular boundary uh, traveling throughout uh, the form and in the form of a line and producing kind of ambiguous, um, ambiguous, uh, ambiguous boundary. Um, the two uh, thin columns in the back are titled VIP Lounge. Uh, they are not, they, they do not touch the scene, you can see, but they don't. Uh, and they're flat, uh, kind of simplified form of an ionic column, and they're supported by bags filled with sand. Um, so, <laughs> so, of course, um, they kind of appear still, I, I argue they appear, appear very stately and uh, important, but they're flimsy and fake. And uh, my argument is that flatness and fakeness do not undermine the status provided by the depicted icon. And, um, you know, I think I talked a little bit about it today already with some of you, but um, the architecture of our like, every day is filled with uh, monuments. It's filled with arch entrances, uh, with, um, you know, mm, pergolas, and even, I don't know, arched, golden arches of McDonald's. Uh, it's, it's a symbol that it's really um, repeated for its status. Um, it doesn't matter what size it is. 
uh, if it's um, if it's small or big, it always sends a message. It requires it requires an acknowledgement, um, the kind of its prominent form, um, and it also doesn't rely anymore on the material. Uh, so you might probably know that arch um, was developed because of the material, brick or stone, uh, to support. It was a supportive uh, structural um, structural form. But no longer that is um, part of the conversation. It doesn't have to be part of the conversation because it is still embedded in our memory as this very important um, form. So another aspect of this piece uh, was this horizontal circular line elevated um, on the series of these vertical supports. Uh, so I want to so show this image because it's exactly 10 inches above the ground, and uh, which is about this much. It is enough to, to mark the space, um, enough to produce a boundary, but it's not a challenging boundary. You can easily step over it. Um, so um, it is very much so a psychological boundary. Um, and I was very interested um, about you know, how much is necessary uh, to produce a space uh, to frame the space, um, and then uh, um, how much is enough to keep us in or keep us out. And so it was interesting to see interactions um, of people with the work, because um, some people were very aware of the boundary, and they would enter through the entry and then leave in the en with the entry. But of course, there were people who would challenge the boundary and I'm 100% sure they were very, very conscious about that. <laughs> um, it was interesting to also kind of work with the space size of the room. I'm quite, um, quite aware of dimensions. I, you know, it's something that comes with um, architectural um, education and practicing. Uh, and then so it was interesting to also find the exact size of the circle when it doesn't feel too big or too small. So it actually feels like a space. Um, I also, I'm also interested in signage as part of the built environment um, and part of architecture. Uh, so the sculpture on the far right, all the way to the right, uh, is titled Monument for Them. And it spells word high. You can't very see very well. but. Uh, high is a very direct salutation. And then um, in the center uh, is sign of their place, which is a landmark. Uh, this rotating sign uh, spells here. It recalls commercial signage. It also explores the notion uh, that people project their basic desire for recognition onto built structures. And uh, not surprisingly, this was a few years ago, Instagram was still young. Um, it was very popular, and visitors photographed themselves with the sign and posted, of course, images with hashtag here to make sure that all their friends and followers knew that, we, that they were there. So it worked perfectly well uh, in all the dimensions. So these are the two next to, next to each other, um, so you can see the high end here. Um, I'm also interested in this kind of idea of reduction of symbols um, and kind of if reducing, um, I always started with uh, quite a lot, almost too much, almost cheesy. I know you're probably all learning about your own process. And then I reduce the amount of language to the point that maybe there's nothing else that can be taken out um, in order to be as straightforward as possible, but also have the quality and character um, so um, I like to explore signage, um, and this one is uh, a model, uh, maybe quite um, uh, quite quick model actually. Uh, it is a proposal for a pavilion, and this project was developed for an exhibition, um, and I was invited by uh, an architect, David Brown. There was a time in Chicago a few years ago. Uh, where um, kind of empty lots, uh, residential lots uh, on the west and south side of Chicago were being sold for $1 to people who lived right in that neighborhood. 
Uh, so it's quite interesting situation. The city uh, was selling them so they don't have to maintain it. Uh, I think that was pretty much a reason. And the contract was that you have to, the person who buys it needs to maintain it and either build or do uh, maintain the land in, in general. So there was a lot of um, speculations and ideas about how to utilize those lots. And uh, so this project was a response to a project called Available City, uh, which stated that each of those uh, lots should be in some percentage always available for public uh, use. And I was asked to produce a very public um, uh, proposal for a building. Uh, so this is from Pavilion, which provides a framework for a community gatherings. And in the forum pavilion, uh, I think I provide a space for people to interact. And I've been interested in, interested in signage as part of this building and wanted to incorporate it. So there are rotating signs. You can imagine that they would rotate uh, of columns, again, portico as kind of symbols of importance, uh, but also an open hand or a hot dog or an ice cream uh, to signify leisure. But I think that both are about gathering. Uh, I was also interested in proposing a very kind of relatively inexpensive and easy to maintain building that has a bold and recognizable form. Um, so positioned within a Chicago neighborhood, um, it kind of borrows the pitch uh, roof typology from the homes uh, and apartment buildings and those neighborhoods. Um, and um, the pavilion is positioned in two city lots. So you can see the scale of this. So you can imagine that would be two extruded house shapes um, of this kind of semi-open um, area. And it has corresponding front yard and backyard. And um, I thought about this as a kind of freestanding structure, but also maybe it could act as a fill uh, on a current vacant lot somewhere in between the buildings. Um, since I was asked to produce this kind of gathering space, I was very interested in the basic need um, for people to gather, to gather around fire especially, and spend time together. And I wanted to provide this opportunity in the pavilion. I think um, we forget um, how important uh, gatherings like this are and I've been interested in this because it doesn't happen a lot in the city. It happens in remote areas. Um, that it really brings people together. Fire, of course, it's very primitive, very primal. And I think it's about enjoying each other's company. But also it's an opportunity to have good time, but also possibly good conversations, important conversations, but maybe not, um, uh, not so in a setting that it doesn't seem so important, um, to simply simply put it. Oh, let's see, whoop, I skipped. So, so I wanted this pavilion to kind of uh, have those opportunities for people to gather. Um, so of course, circle is a very democratic um, form uh, where everybody's equal. And I think the pavilion uh, functions as a space somewhere between a living room and public plaza backyard and a park. Um, it's open shared areas can host semi-private activities such as block parties, barbecues, hangouts, or afternoon teas with a neighbor. Um, and then so you can see that the kind of frame, the kind of stripy frame is um, kind of this air semi-open structure, but there's another little kind of building within it that actually would produce the enclosure during the winter um, season. And the pattern of the enclosure borrows from the fences that protect, hide, or reveal the activities happening inside. As well, I think they can produce very strong graphic interests and decoration, and especially for the use of shadows. And um, I hope that this will play. This is something that I also got from Instagram from this person. Uh, when it was exhibited in the, in, the, in the show, you can see actually the effect of the enclosure. All right. 
So uh, a few years ago, I think it's been three years, um, I was selected as a finalist for a MoMA PS1 Young Architects uh, program. And I don't know if you're familiar with it. This is something that um, it's very known in architecture field. Uh, it's a competition that um, you're kind of being selected by, um, by somebody. Somebody has to select you in order for you to even compete. And then you submit portfolio. And then if you're a finalist, you compete against four other people. <clears throat> and in a very short amount of time, you have to prepare uh, a proposal for a courtyard, uh, for a MOA PS1 courtyard. And the proposal is usually a statement of your um, practice, but also needs to house um, a giant party. It's a festival that is being held there during the summertime. Uh, it's called Warm Up uh, and brings in, I don't know how many people, but that court is completely filled with bodies next to each other. <laughs> um, so... So there was a lot of interesting uh, considerations um, with this proposal. And uh, these are the previous installations uh, that I've been admiring um, for years. And so I was very proud to be part of, the, part of the competition. To be part of the competition is enough. Like, you don't have to win it. <laughs> or I felt that I don't know, like that's, that's nice already. Um, so we proposed, um, I had a team, uh, and we proposed uh, a project that was called We Are All Here Now. And the title is the Acknowledgement of Togetherness and Presence. So you can see that it's kind of uh, maybe a tying thread in my work. Um, it is, uh, so the project consisted of a series of iconic pavilions that established unique social spaces. And like the gate uh, on the left top, um, plaza on the right side, uh, circle, and haha -ha pavilion. And so on, you can see that on the right side, this was kind of, this is the entry point. You enter from this, you know, from this point of a triangle. And um, so this one, the, the entry point displays the title and then mists the audience, audience kind of initiating them into the experience. Um, and the plaza offers a uh, space for gathering and variety of uses. Circular structure uh, marks and defines a space and frames the participants. Actually, what is interesting and maybe awkward is that the stage is on top of the staircase in there. So not everybody can actually see it. So we're also thinking about how to maybe produce spaces for people to hang out, even if they can actually see the act. Um, and the circle is actually this kind of in-between space. That's where would people uh, gather. Uh, so, um, so each structure uh, utilizes this kind of shared understanding of common architectural and cultural elements and reconfigures them uh, in order to offer a kind of new understanding and new experiences. Uh, so the plaza, um, uh, there was kind of one of the... Mm, one of the things was incorporating water, so it has really this um, kind of cooling pool in this contrasting blue. Uh, the dark, deep blue color is used throughout the project, um, which kind of serves several functions. It unifies the individual pavilions as a whole, uh, provides an intensive and kind of somewhat surreal visual experience. And also, and this is very cheesy, uh, but this is social media color. Like we are, we love blue as humans. Um, so it seemed appropriate for <laughs> for that as a kind of inspiring kind of social engagement. Um, and then um, also had another function. Um, we proposed um, kind of separate structures um, uh, for the for the plaza in order to uh, deinstall them or install them there, and then deinstall them later on in different contexts. So we had um, approved um, uh, placement of the pavilions in Chicago and Detroit. And we actually kind of, when we were thinking about this project, we also wanted it to make to make sure that it's kind of, um, uh, that we can put it together uh, simply 
dismantle it, put it in a truck and move it. So we're kind of interested in this use of minimal amount of materials um, and a system and a kind of efficient system. Uh, so it can produce that for us. Um, it was really part of this kind of idea of maybe, um, uh, and I think so the, the blue as well was the kind of moment when even if they were separated, they would still stand on their own and would still clearly signify their present within presence within uh, another another um, context. So I think that circular kind of pavilion, uh, I think it really exemplifies that notion. It's a very minimal use of material. And of course, kind of as the previous work, you can see it's assembled such a way that to produce the maximum kind of effect and impact. And um, we, we thought that it's not very imposing on the audience, but we um, understood as a kind of moment where people will start to gather. And then, so this is the shade uh, um, in the, where there's one space that was very kind of small. And then, so we decided to hand the shade um, with cutout letters, which project the light onto the room in the form of ha, 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 ha. Uh, and uh, we thought that would be a very Instagrammable moment. So this is the plaza. Again, uh, we thought that it can function in the morning just as a kind of um, place to kind of sit and relax. Um, during the noon, there will be more people gathering and using it as a bench. Uh, in the afternoon and in the evening, uh, especially would become a dense floor. There was not a consideration the plaza actually has gravel, so it produced a lot of dust. So we wanted to produce some kind of surface on which um, people could actually dance. And then similarly with uh, Circle, we kind of predicted that um, it will start to gather, gather people. Um, so uh, this is interesting shift because I think that um, I really enjoy working with furniture and smaller objects uh, because it really gives me um, gives me understanding of um, what is possible. And also, uh, it's also quite a nice way to test out interactions and kind of impact of, um, impact of form, of impact of objects in space. So this is, um, this is a series of furniture called SET. Uh, it is furniture that redefines function and typology. Uh, obscures the clarity of the object and relationship it has within uh, with the person and space around it. It is a kind of it's a clear collection of units. They share similar physical qualities. Um, I think they're consistent in color, material, scale, shape. So they're very self-aware. Um, they're also. Um, act as a set, but also very much so very autonomous as, um, as its own entity. And um, I think that they do appear kind of familiar as furniture, but also um, maybe removed in some way. Uh, they're very shiny, very hard. Uh, they seem sculptural and possibly um, precious uh, and powerful. And, um, and also I think there are some elements that maybe bring some references in our, kind of from our memory. So they're kind of, uh, the forms are exaggerated uh, in such way as to kind of achieve this very authoritative um, and imposing propor proportions. So I was interesting that the, the, it really is a set uh, for kind of play, almost, uh, a set for a person and set for objects. So an example, uh, these two uh, are coffee tables. Um, they don't have a horizontal tap surface. I was asked many, many times if there's going to be a glass on top of it. Uh, but it is uh, composed of vertical pegs. They are organized in such a way that on the left side, they're quite um, often, there's I think 50 of them, so they're very close to each other. So then you can actually uh, put your books, display them in vertical manner. 
You can also put a book on top and it will, will the surface functions exactly the same as if it was really a horizontal surface. And then you can put your coffee on it if you want to. Uh, but I think it really starts to kind of engage a person um, uh, and objects in such a way that you're really creating this setting for yourself. And on the right side, the, the tubes are a little bit bigger, so it's kind of four inches, so you can hold a cup, um, coffee mug, um, or maybe display some tchotchkes that you have around or found objects. And then so it becomes really kind of a little, like a pedestal for your objects. You can also, of course, wedge maybe a blanket in between uh, and between those pegs as well. Um, so I think it's something that, you know, I think it starts to kind of be hyper aware and kind of hyper aware of other objects, uh, object itself, other objects, and also your own kind of uh, body and interaction or kind of um, um, your play with it. Um, with um, this arm chair, uh, this one sets your attitude, uh, this oversized horizontal tube. Um, it's in the, you know, it's very familiar, uh, but it's probably expected to be soft. Again, uh, the dimensions play quite a uh, big role in this piece. The tube is actually like uh, one foot in diameter. Uh, the chair is lower. Um, so when you sit in it, uh, you have no choice because there's not enough space in here. You have no choice, but you have to put your arms around. You have to sit back and you actually end up having very powerful position. So, <laughs> so it's a little bit like a frown, uh, but really, uh, it's, it, even if it's simplicity, it works every single time. Uh, you're also very aware of the shininess of the, of the object and the kind of hard surface. Even though it maybe seems uncomfortable, it is actually comfortable enough to sit there for some time, maybe not full day. Um, but I think you're, you're quite removed from the space around you as well by the kind of uh, size of it. So it kind of functions in, in this very, uh, very specific way. And then on the right side, you can see there is a cushion to, of course, negotiate a comfort level. Uh, it's a loose kind of blanket, so you can wrap yourself with it. Um, it's quite nice. It's uh, it's nicely nicely filled with uh, dawn, <laughs> and um, so it also kind of when you wrap yourself in a chair, you also um, becoming um, kind of in your own individual space. So it has. It's interesting how the blanket actually changed the the kind of um, the kind of uh, the way you sit in it, so one, you have no choice, you have to do this. Another one, you, you most likely will wrap yourself, but you're still the most important person in the room, no matter what. Uh, and I like to talk about this example. I wish I took photos with, uh, or kind of took photos that maybe recreate some of the, some of the actions that would happen. Um, I like this one because it's very nuanced, um, almost nothing. Uh, but it's a table, regular size table for four people, except that it has this very oversized legs on their sides. And also it's very narrow. Um, so when you uh, sit across from each other, you have only enough space for two plates. You don't have space for additional um, stuff that usually goes in the middle of the table, like you know, additional dishes or flowers. So you have to push everything to the side. So then the side's now becoming usable for your objects, not for people necessarily. And then you have no, <laughs> you're forced to look at the other people very closely. So again, it's producing a bit of attention uh, and also very slightly alters the kind of typical use and typology of the, of the table. Um, and this is again the installation shot. Uh, this is a credenza, um, which um, is composed out of these two cylinders. It's on a podium. Uh, the podium has a border around it. Um, and so it actually, um, what I like to do uh, with this is that it doesn't have really defined side. It doesn't have a back or front or a clear back or front. So it could be a freestanding object 
in the middle of the room or it will never be pushed against the wall because it actually has that platform that it kind of moves it away from the wall. So it's also assuring with these very small moves that if the objects will end up with an environment I can't control, I can at least control how much space they require around. <laughs> so you can see in here, actually, the credenza would require space because then the, the leaves of the, of the, um, of the doors open uh, widely and then uh, reveal what's inside, which also, I think, produces a tension of this very um, strong object in space, but hiding uh, things from the viewer. Uh, so one might wonder what might be actually uh, stored inside and if it's ever going to be revealed. Um, and then on the other side, actually, it started to almost function as a room divider. So that was quite a nice, um, quite a nice discovery. And a side chair, um, also very simplistic um, and, um, and maybe the cutest out of all of them. Uh, <laughs> I think it has the, the legs. I wanted to make them kind of a size of a person's leg. So maybe it starts to have some kind of, of those qualities. Uh, it also has a cushion on it to kind of negotiate the comfort level. But it's also about the surface and this kind of flatness of the um, horizontal and back uh, and the thinness of the material um, to kind of make your sitting kind of elevated um, in that sense. So you're kind of aware of the object and your position in the object. Uh, another aspect of the work um, was, uh, of course, the lacquer, uh, which is kind of a, like a piano um, lacquer. I, I had actually piano refinishers to do this work. It was extremely time consuming um, because it's not really applied gloss um, layer on top. It's actually matte paint that is painted over and over and over again. It needs to dry in between layers. And then you sand it and you bath it and then you use like a little lotion to make it shiny and mirror-like. So you really, it's a lot of handwork. Um, and especially if you can imagine with all those pegs, ah, uh, that was a lot. Um, they were doing this, they were running out of time. Uh, so a little bit about the process. Uh, yeah, we were sitting in the, ref like the refinisher's shop uh, like 10 people bathing those pegs, eating Wendy's. <laughs> uh, so this is me a few years ago. Uh, so this is kind of a prototype. So uh, the structure, you never know what the material is, um, and you don't see connections. So you don't see any screws, you don't see any other detail. And I was quite deliberate about, oh, except this one, obviously you needed to have a hinge. Um, but I was very, very interested in the fact that they're kind of, maybe a little bit removed from this kind of typical construction method of furniture. Um, but it was a process. So you can see the, um, the armrest actually was a challenging one. Uh, so it went through a few different hands and a few different people. So there was a CNC pink foam that then I stacked and uh, sent it off. You can see the kind of early prototyping. Then on the left side, the image is of the mold um, of, um, uh, I'm sorry, fiberglass mold. And then on the right side is the actual fiberglass uh, tube. And then this is when it was capped and send it off. And this is really how it looks without the, without the lacquer, which I think it's quite dramatic change just with the color and just with the with the surface. Uh, so I've been uh, lucky enough to be able to explore some more ideas uh, in terms of furniture and in terms of actually furniture that maybe misbehave a little bit. So I was invited for um, this exhibition, um, Room with its own rules, that's what it's called. And I love that um, uh, title. I utilized it again and again, actually, in, in my teaching, actually, uh, because what it means is that it's its own rules. So you can establish your own rules, but you still have to have your rules. And uh, it's, of, of course, also about domestic space. So the exhibition collected uh, actually female designers. Uh, it was in Chamber Gallery in New York, and I produced those three um, black um, objects. I call them soft pavilions. 
And I also kind of play with the idea that maybe their use is unclear. Um, so also um, placed within the space of the room, uh, maybe it shares some kind of qualities um, with other objects, but also kind of removes them. There are this tall. Um, there are soft, and um, they have, I think they have very bold appearance, uh, but they have a very soft structure. So you can see the, <laughs> the chair is packed with memory foam. Uh, so you can sit on it and slowly sink into the chair. Memory foam feels very good. Also, when it warms up, it really forms into your body. So the longer you sit in it, the longer, the more it collapses and the more it becomes really perfect. And then it just pops right back. So it's quite nice to have this kind of experience and the kind of almost kinetic, um, kinetic um, piece of furniture. And um, how, how are we with time? I'm sorry, I, I can't, I don't have the time here. Seven minutes, okay, great. Um, so another, um, another show, uh, it was uh, called No Thing at Friedman Benda Gallery, and it was really showcasing furniture um, by architects, so uh, several architecture offices were commissioned to produce furniture. And um, my proposal is this big uh, uh, wooden shelf. Uh, it's a freestanding um, free shelf, and I also, of course, again, I wanted to redefine the function and typology of furniture, and I wanted to kind of obscure the clarity of the object. And I played with the idea of it being freestanding, uh, but also playing with the kind of space of the room, like never quite fitting. Um, and then, so it's quite, it's, it's a white oak. It was beautifully done, not by me. Um, I had a great person who was doing this work, but you can see there's two sides. It's kind of the scallop back and then front. And what it also does, it really divides the space of the room. So it can never be pushed against the wall. So one side will always have to kick back or maybe two sides will kick back. Or actually, I, my dream was that it will be possibly changing the shape of the room if it is um, pushed against the corner, maybe not pushed completely, but kind of in the corner. So it actually will start to impact the reading of the architectural space. So that's how I can control <laughs> architecture. So I was interested, I started to be interested in the idea of a corner um, in architecture. Um, and then I really found this image quite interesting. This is um, photographs by uh, Irving Penn. He photographed uh, famous people, and what he found is that if he put two pieces of wall together next to each other in a corner and kind of wedged their, um, you know, the, the client or the, the the person in, it became quite apparent to him that the corner was became very comfortable. The people he didn't have to give uh, instructions uh, to a person; they were kind of kind of felt like we're in their space that they could actually maybe, you know, kind of do whatever they felt uh, compelled to. Like this, this space impacted the behavior. Um, so, of course, um, some of those kind of thoughts are coming too from uh, work of Robert Morris. Um, as you know, of course, um, uh, from this corner piece that is uh, also changing our perception of the corner and uh, in this case, of course, of art and then, then Flavin, uh, which po who positions the light onto the corner, but also not making the corner available. It's gated, right? So it's kind of this lidded, beautiful space, but then we're not part of it, but we see it. So I think um, this is something that I'm researching, and I'm also researching this in my teaching. Um, but I love this photo uh, from the outside and these two awesome architects that I absolutely admire. They were just pointing and like, look, you can even see it from the top. <laughs> so I wanted to show off. All right, so I'm going to just talk briefly about this project. This is the last project I want to talk about. Um, it's called the Subjective Catalog of Columns. And um, 
So I think this is a summary almost of uh, all the other things. And you can see that I work in different scales and mediums. And this is a series of screen printed posters that, um, that depict uh, images of columns taken out of the context of the building or ta taken out of the context of the history or maybe a context of our environment, popular culture, or popular environment. So I thought that uh, I established that column itself, it's structural, it's decorative, but also it's a carrier of a specific message. And, um, and I think that um, we're all familiar with um, Greek uh, columns, and they've been present in our Western culture for ages, and they always represent, depending of course of the context and use, status, stability, knowledge, um, or taste. Uh, they send very specific message. Um, and then so uh, I also found out that, of course, um, through the trajectory, the history of architecture, the column becomes more slender and skinnier. There's, of course, uh, engineering is very impactful on architecture. And they do, um, column also elevates, uh, can elevate a building. Uh, it removes the walls. So has quite a lot of um, quite a lot of applications, but also I really was interested in the fact that it sends a message. So this one kind of pairs it's a subjective catalog, so pairs this kind of technological advancements with traditional methods, kind of sophisticated concepts with vernacular, and some are very kind of particular to kind of insider kind of architectural history, uh, maybe and some kind of. Uh, maybe uh, still very understandable um, to uh, uh, public, uh, to the public, and I think maybe their plate is kind of in between. Like you can get it by looking at image, but also can dive in uh, in order to um, in order to kind of read the meaning a little bit more. So this is a little sampler. On the left, this is of course two sticks tied together, an original column number one, a precedent. And on the right side is an image titled Faking It. So it actually really points at the fact that, um, you know, that uh, uh, the fake, faking of the authority, stability, uh, that is, you know, kind of representing of the institution of the building or people who occupy the building. And as the previous one, it's it's really the depiction. It doesn't have to be structural. It doesn't have to be well done. It always sends the same message. Oh, I'm going wrong. On the left, uh, a column called Saint uh, it alludes to Mies van der Rohe, uh, with this kind of he he's known for this cruciform column, very slender, minimal, has a halo. It's kind of a response to um, his followers and his kind of elevated status. On the right side as wooden column on fire. So this left represents modernism, right represents postmodernism. It is um, a column taken out of the building uh, designed by Venturi Scott Brown. And the architects um, are, their statement is that this is the first um, re historical reference in architecture in the last half of the century. So the pairing of it is quite intentional. And it's wooden, and it's stout, and it's quite, oh, it's actually called ironic. And I wanted to um, put a fire on it. Um, and it doesn't show if it's actually burning down, of this is a fire of like eternal fire, eternal flame. Uh, it's also paired with the title of the popular song, um, We Didn't Start the Fire, It Was Always Burning. Um, so I think it has kind of this kind of idea of uh, postmodernism in architecture is this kind of unresolved issue maybe still, and there are kind of people who uh, are very opposed to it or maybe really into it. And of course, at the time, um, the kind of modernism, postmodernism, and Chicago context, um, and would have to go into a huge story right now. <laughs> And I think that was kind of, no, these were two examples very specifically chosen to kind of comment on this. But there's also some kind of lighter, um, maybe references. So this is a column that does not touch the ground. It actually produces a shadow on the ground and the shadow spells, ha, 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 ha. It's called whoops. And uh, it references some of the gestures that maybe are 
um, uh, familiar to some of us and um, present throughout the history of architecture. Uh, so this is also another topic. Um, here also the 90s slanted, slender, colorful columns. Um, this is um, this column and beam structure is um, spelling wow, but this is actually derived uh, from the proposal on the right side. So your left side, you can see the 90s from the right side of this amazing idea uh, by um, Greg Lynn uh, for the structural system that by this kind of weaving and overlapping and intersecting, you can actually produce structural system that really challenges the form of the column and beam. Uh, so this is this kind of wow idea represented in that poster. And some of my uh, projections on the left is the future. Uh, on the right side is the future is informed by the past. So it's kind of like the Solomonic column, kind of 80s maybe take on it. They're both are impassable yet, um, but we'll get there. And um, there are also some instances, so it was quite, I didn't know what to do about misrepresentation of women um, in architecture in, in any field. Um, so I decided to kind of produce this uh, woman-like, a very kind of cliche um, form of a column, um, and it's called It's Not Easy. And I think this one, it's kind of commenting on the past, but also I think it's helpful. Uh, I think the field, especially architecture field, it was pretty responding to that. It's becoming more inclusive. It's less about the kind of elevated icons um, and it's about kind of individual expression. And I think um, probably a lot of practices right now are in fields are like that. And all of them, they kind of found its way um, into this structure very loosely uh, referencing Parthenon. Uh, so all those columns, contradicting columns under one roof that really offer both praise and critique kind of making equal the varied conditions and um, and kind of maybe also uh, starting a conversation and talking about the value um, or per perceived value. And just to finish, this is my dream project that I wish to continue. Um, I learned that the column, of course, is not only in the building, but also, of course, in the logos of different companies. So this kind of selection of logos that I found and some of the subtitles that are applied to it. Um, and then so displaying a solid foundation, this is University of Illinois, and that's an I, that is one ionic column with an I. Uh, the very strange one, so uh, uh, the, the kind of L there, it was like learner um, law office. <laughs> so it's like an L. <laughs> And then on the right was the strangest one. It was a dentist um, for the office. So it's super top, you know, top service. Best. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll take questions. We've got a microphone so we can hear you. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you about your, your work is beautiful, by the way. I love Thank it you. so much. Um, your relationship to your initial ideas and then as you move into fabrication and working with fabricators, um, if you find that to be a negotiation, um, a time in which uh, your idea becomes maybe sacrificed or... Uh, or if, if you push on fabricators towards ingenuity to kind of realize the initial idea? Yeah, no, it's always a, there's always some kind of drama <laughs> in any project. And then the fabrication, it depends. Like it's, there's a lot of different issues, not only about, like it's of course about money, right? How much money you have and how well of a detail somebody can produce for you or maybe even if they like you or not, um, or if you like them or not. Um, I, so it's been, uh, it's been a while to kind of maybe establish kind of who I work with. I also find it challenging and uh, 
Oh, I went to this uh, upholstery shop once, and then I found it challenging because it's usually men, older men. Not that I have anything against, but they're kind of the older kind of type. And it takes me three meetings to convince them that I'm actually, that my ideas are valid and I know what I'm doing. So that's a challenging part. So that's, there's always a negotiation. There's always phone calls. Like when we were producing that uh, neon yellow, and uh, those fabricators are good friends with them. And, and I trust in them completely with the fabrication. Um, but they ran into challenges. So then there's also that, like, it was all of a sudden too heavy. I wanted very skinny. They stretched it to the point that, like, it was breaking point almost. Um, then, because it was so heavy, we needed to have a crane. So it added, of course, the cost of the production, which then my clients didn't want to pay for this, let's say. But not to say that it was a huge drama. It was just like little things like this. One really <laughs> funny thing that happened was that they were painting uh, that color in their shop under fluorescent uh, lights. So they couldn't see what they were doing because it was so intense. It was really intense. So I was getting a lot of phone calls. And it was, of course, like they were painting right before we're going to install it, right? So I was getting a lot of phone calls like three times a day that I'm irresponsible. Uh, people will, the people were supposed to sit at the desk all day long to, you know, serve the, <laughs> serve the community or people who visit. And they thought that people will get sick. <laughs> and then so I had to convince them three times a day that it's okay, that the lighting condition affects this paint. So it was kind of, yeah, so there's always challenges. A lot of times, or maybe I've learned to use opportunities. So let's say the upholstery, amazing collaboration that we have right now. Past certain point, we're super, they produce amazing work. So I really want to do more upholstery because I have this, um, this connection. So I'm kind of trying to maybe also be a little bit opportunistic about things. Yeah, but yeah, there's always a thing. <laughs> Sometimes it's a thing that... I overdo it in the, in, the, in the fact that I want some detail and it's impossible and then maybe I have to give up, of course. Uh, I think now more often than before I consider uh, how it's going to be made uh, so I can foresee um, certain, certain things. Yeah. That's reassuring that we all struggle, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, the, the bookshop was actually welded by a team of super amazing people. And then um, the most detailed person uh, was actually a woman who, who welded, too. It was kind of nice to have that. I don't have anything, anything in this, guys. Uh, really, I don't. Uh, <laughs> but it's just nice, um, nice to, to see diversity. Um, about your uh, mm -hmm. black furniture pieces, mm -hmm. you were talking about the table and the experience that the user would experience with their with mm -hmm. their body. Um, but I didn't do those chairs function with that table. No, they don't. But, mm -hmm. And so you would sit at that table with a chair that doesn't. Some other chairs. Oh I don't know no. which chairs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that the the last chair that I showed, that little cute one, I thought maybe this one would be the um, the dining chair, but it just didn't didn't feel right. Uh, and I thought that maybe it would be even stronger as a piece if there were different chairs that somebody else selects their own chair. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think that. Uh, yeah, I, this is my kind of dream that I didn't do, like kind of photograph it in a kind of domestic environment and kind of maybe uh, stage some kind of very, mm, very kind of over, over the top kind of, you know, images of this kind of certain dinner <laughs> that people have. I also see some of those things being like a talk show, like especially the, the big one, a talk show kind of chair that everybody's just 
you know, quite confident. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Um, what do you have projects that are upcoming or that you're working on? Yeah, I do. Next. I do have a few projects. I'm actually in, I'm gonna in between deadlines. Um, but maybe like I can tie into those two questions actually about fabrication and the upcoming project. I will have another series of furniture uh, for volume gallery, so the same uh, gallery that the black furniture was made for. And um, it is furniture that is uh, about brick. And then it's been a challenge to how to represent brick. So it's a it's kind of like combining furniture and then screen printing together because it's kind of an image of a brick and I found that it's brick has been you know explored as a as a graphic quite widely so it's you know, simultaneously exploration of brick as a as a building block and maybe also part of architecture Chicago is built out of brick there's a Chicago common brick uh, it's present everywhere I mean it's 99 percent of the city and um, yeah, so so yeah, so this is something that I'm working on and it's been quite challenging in terms of fabrication, but not necessarily because of a let's say fabricator, but because it's a really challenging project. So I had to I'm still waiting for results on Friday. I will see if it's gonna work out. <laughs> to be very honest. <laughs> it will. So it's gonna open in May. Um so I think everything is needs to be in production uh starting on Monday. Practically, yeah. Uh, there are some other projects too. Um, mm, I don't, oh, hmm. I signed some forms, and I, now I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I can talk about it. <laughs> so I won't. I can tell you like after. <laughs> Oh, I have it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, one more. Uh, necklace. I'm designing a necklace, which is the most challenging thing for me to do. I've learned how to deal with space um, and the, the range of scales, but the scale of a body is a, something that is quite challenging. Um, so I think I always come from this kind of thinking of architecture, even though I'm working with an image or working with furniture some principles that are, I'm kind of, you know, interested in. And then so um, I was invited to come for this amazing trip to Taiwan. I went there twice and they, uh, because of lacquer, it's going to be fr uh, um, jewelry made out of lacquer. Um, and but their lacquer, it's next level of time, precision, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, but I also, they also wanted to expression of um, Taiwanese culture and it's kind of you know interesting how to kind of negotiate that with your own work um, so the necklace will consist of this very like big black piece also very powerful I think I'm trying to maybe give a power to a person but on the back you will have LED lights kind of that you find in Asia a lot <laughs> yeah yeah Mm -hmm. um, do you produce those with the intention of just strictly making the one set for the gallery, or do you intend to like replicate that if people are interested in I intend to replicate. So the set, um, it's usually established by a gallery how many pieces. They're obviously for a gallery, you know, the very specific client. Uh, it's not mass production, but it's series of um, I don't know, just few, maybe three or four edition. Um, and maybe also fabrication. It's also, now I know, like if I wanted to reproduce that, I did it at certain, um, in, within a certain time, within a certain budget. Now it's much more difficult if I wanted to do one off, let's say, uh, or one next one. Um, so it's, uh, it's almost, it's the same amount of work, and we've done, with the gallery, we've done projects that were um, kind of um, custom pieces that were kind of from that show, but not exactly the same pieces, um, other pieces. 
and every piece was <laughs> was an interesting challenge and i think uh, with this next show, I'm actually also thinking about how to maybe replicate things. It's also it's logistics because you need to do it within six weeks and then you need to line up your fabricators. Uh, and especially if it's done by different people, it's kind of a logistical situation. Yeah. I would love to, but yeah, yeah, I think that's actually an excellent thing. Usually mm, I would love to do that and I would love to have an opportunity to do it and have them on hand or even just, you know, kind of venture into mass production. Yeah. I think it was, it would be a dream if I had an opportunity. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Anya. Thank you.